You know, I had you, I, I'm convinced before this conference that we were bringing in the ex-governor. And I said, I, he doesn't know anything about trees. And then I realized there's more than one Gary Johnson. Gary's been in, on the facility of the University of Minnesota's uh, Department of Forest Services since 1992. That's a long time. He's currently Professor Emeritus. I had to look that up. It means remaining active while retired. His research has focused on tree health management, impacts on planting practices, and tree production on long-term health and tree failures during wind loading events. Prior to the University of Minnesota, he was at the University of New Hampshire on the faculty and also at the University of Maryland. He spent 10 years as a seasonal nursery worker, hard work, and more than 20 years as a practicing and consulting arborist. Would you please help me introduce Professor Gary Johnson? What? Well, I'm assuming, yep, it's on, boom. Why is it every time I get introduced right before that, somebody says, I hope you're well caffeinated. You know, it doesn't matter if I'm the first speaker of the day or the fifth, right before, it was good. Well, I hope you're all well caffeinated. Um, so I am back and I think we're ready to go. Do I just hit the first? So yesterday, Clay, or this morning, Clay said something about it's going to be 56 degrees today. And I flippantly said, oh, that's like a day in June in Minnesota, which is really a gross exaggeration. It's like a day in May, but it's still really, really nice to, uh, to be here and, and to thaw out for a, few, for a couple of days anyway. So as we go through um, our little talk this morning, a, a couple of things I want you to, to try to keep in mind. Uh, one is... Research is like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. We all work on one little piece of it. There have been very, 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 very few research studies historically that at the end, they go, oh, problem solved, covered everything. So everything we talk about today that I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna make very, very sure that I, I talk about things that have exper you know, Evidence from different experiments, evidence from different studies. Notice I didn't say facts. Uh, along, I'm really old person, which, uh, you know, that's the good news. Uh, uh, the bad news, I'm going to be up here for 60 minutes. But being really old, I had a lot of coffee this morning. So there's a real good chance you're all going to have a chance to uh, stretch your legs about every 10 minutes. But the, the thing about facts, I, I was always taught that nothing is factual until it's proven wrong. You prove something wrong, you go, okay, that's a fact that's wrong. When, when, you, when you come up with evidence that seems to be right, doesn't mean it's a fact yet. If it keeps getting repeated and repeated and repeated and everybody's like, boy, you know, we, this thing's been tested 20 times and we come out with the same results every day. Maybe you're getting closer to a fact or at least a semi-truth of some sort. So as we go through today, don't, don't be thinking that everything that, we, that, that I talk about up here is absolute facts. It's just stuff we're finding out, little pieces of that jigsaw puzzle. And the, jig, the whole puzzle is how do we keep trees healthier? More importantly, how do we improve canopy? That, that's my goal today as we go through. So um, I've been involved in, in a lot of planting programs and quite honestly, I do look at them as sticks in the ground. Uh, people get really excited. There, there are some programs, initiatives across the country, you know, a million trees in, in a year, a million trees in 10 years. Um, kind of what I hear is like, all right, maybe best case scenario, you may have 400,000 of them actually surviving for a while. And maybe at the end of the story, when it gets up to, are they really producing canopy? I don't know, maybe 200,000 of them actually did that. Um, so not that I'm against planting programs, it does get excited, people excited, but 
Um, I'm really looking for canopy, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to look at it in three in three stages. One is the newly planted trees. So basically, the first five years, what what are the things that you know enable them to survive or not survive? And then we're going to go into the establishment years. Those years from you know, roughly year five up to maybe year 30 or year 40, something like that. And then the last part is going to be what I call the assisted living years. And that's our mature trees. What kind of things can we do to, to help ensure that they last a little bit longer? So Laura Roman came out with this study and published it in 2014. She does a really good job of collecting a lot of data too. And one of the things that she found was this is nationally that Six, less than 60% of planted trees are alive five years later. You know, quite honestly, I think that's, my gut feeling is that's a little generous. Um, I, would, I would say it's probably pretty close. And she's a really good researcher too. Here's what we're gonna look at today, these challenges. And by the way, I, you know, I uh, think Trees New Mexico can have both PowerPoints I'm given today, so they can post them as, you know, you don't have to take notes. I guess that's the bottom line. And these are some of the things we're going to look at. As you look at these things, you're probably thinking, oh, he left out, he left out, he left, yeah, there are a lot more things involved in this, but we only have 60 minutes. So we're going to kind of go through those, those points and how does size matter, or does size even matter? And you'll, you'll hear some smack about, well, one of the problems planting really, really small trees is a real, real high um, mortality rate. Yeah, it could be in certain areas too. Um, and then with the big trees, you know, Gary Watson uh, did this research years ago that for each inch of caliper, you have one year of transplant shock. We're not talking about transplant shock. We're talking about life and death. So does size matter? Well, sometimes it does. There's not been a lot of research on that, but what we have found that if you say size and species, mix them together, yeah, it does matter. Uh, and if you've tried growing small or, you know, calipered oaks, especially bare, actually even containerized, uh, many of the oaks, many of the hickories, um, yeah, the larger you transplant, the greater the mortality rate. It's just a fact of life. So if you mix that in there, yes, there is some truth to that. Uh, if you mix in size and harvest type matter. So if, if, if you all don't have ANSI Z60.1 on your smartphones, you should. That's your protection when you buy nursery stock that it meets the minimum standards. So if you have a, a particular size and it doesn't meet the minimum standards, especially for root size, yeah, size does matter. And then finally, if you did or if you did a really poor job of site preparation, or you just didn't do any site preparation, yeah, the bigger the tree is, the more it's gonna struggle, more difficult it's gonna be. So we did um, a couple studies on this, and these, these actually turned out really well. This is typical for trying to get bur oaks, calipered bur oaks, trying to get them established, at least in the upper Midwest. We got this nice little skirt of green, the rest of the tree is dead. Uh, this is very, very common. So one of the things that we did, this was for the city of St. Paul, and the city of St. Paul has a lot of remnant uh, bur, bur oak primarily forest, and they turned them in the parks. So they had real high mortality rates of the, of the older trees in there, and they've been trying to establish new and younger trees, and they end up looking like this. They look like garbage, and eventually they get removed. So one of the things that we did with these is we put them in tree shelters and tree shelters, tree tubes, whatever you want to call them. Um, it's worked out really, really well. We plant them in mass. So we'll mulch a big area and we'll plant in mass, you know, three, four or five feet on center, put them in the tree shelters, phenomenal results, 100% survival rate. And this was quite a few trees as well over hundred trees in this one park. Um, and some of these grew as fast as they were seven feet tall at the end of the third growing season, which is phenomenal for the upper Midwest. Especially, we started them as 18 to 24 inch liners. Seven feet tall after three years. So there are some things that you can do. But we did find some, um, that there, wa there was some other differences with species. And I, and I realize this is a little difficult to see, but if you look at the very top, these are called adjusted probability of mortality. So what we looked at is all these, by the way, this particular study, and then I'm referencing now, we had about six and a half thousand trees in it. Of those six and a half, this uh, about four and a half thousand uh, of those trees gave us enough um, 
replicates. So the species you're looking on here um, had a minimum of 150 replicates in this particular study. And if you look at it, so we adjusted it for the size, whether they were bare root, bald and burlap, containerized, and these are the adjusted mortality rates. And if you look at Catalpa, shoot, you had to be quick on that one, uh, it's 2.03. That's the adjusted, you know, if you're gonna predict what the mortality rate is, 2.03%. If you look down at the bottom, uh, Nissa sabbatica, which is black gum, um, 46 point, or 45.7, about half of them are gonna die roughly. So there's quite a range. If you look up to the middle, well, maybe up to right about here, right about here, this is the average. The average is 12.25. These are the trees that fell into the average and below average. So you can see about half of them were in the average to below it. So yeah, we found in this particular case that species did matter. Other studies, and this is a really, really good study too, they found absolutely no difference. Species had no effect at all. And if you think about it, <clears throat> different parts of the country, different times of the year when things are planted, et cetera. If, if we have a couple years of drought, all these things can affect it. This particular study had 749 trees. We had four and a half thousand uh, in that particular species study. So maybe, maybe that's what really was the, the deciding factor on that. It, they just didn't have quite as many trees as we had. Maybe that was it. The thing is you find different results in different areas. This is that little forest that we planted, um, several of these. And if you look at that bur oak popping out of that four foot tube, that's the second year. So it's over four feet tall, starting from an 18 to 24 inch, it works, it works. And if you're wondering, it's like, boy, those trees are awfully close. Um, there's a couple of things you can think of. Have you ever been through a forest? You'll see trees two feet apart in a forest, or as this community is doing, as they mature and get looking better, they're picking out the best ones. In each one of these planting islands, they're thinning them down to two trees. The thing is 100% survival rate. Well, how about harvest type? And when we talk about harvest type, we're talking about, you know, were they harvested and sold and planted as bare root in the springtime? A bare root from a gravel bed, so you can plant them in the autumn, uh, containerized or bald and burlap. So bare rooted in the spring, in the upper Midwest, this is our most dangerous planting. This is where we're gonna have the highest mortality rates because we never know what summer's gonna be. We can have a summer where it's cool and wet and just wonderful for trees, just as likely it's gonna be bone dry and hot and windy. So springtime planting, and especially with bare root, it's, it's a very, very iffy thing in the upper Midwest. Uh, healing those trees in instead of planting them, but healing them in in pea stone, we call them gravel bed trees. Uh, this allows you to wait until the end of the summer. Uh, and in Minnesota, I planted out of our gravel beds as late as the first week of December. So you can plant well into the autumn, late in the autumn, uh, in the meantime, while they're in the gravel bed, this is kind of what happens to the root system. They explode with the finer root systems. Um, <clears throat> I don't really know if that explosion of finer roots is that much more advantageous. The big thing is you're planting them at a time of year that's cooler, generally more moist, more moisture is coming down and less of a labor crunch. Because in the springtime, there are so many other things demanding your attention and now you have to plant all these trees and now you have to keep them watered all summer long. That's the advantage of it. Containerized trees, the smooth plastic containers, that's been the nursery standard for a long time, but you can also have to the right, you can have the air root pruning containers. Sometimes they're called architectural containers. Uh, you can have bags to the upper left. You can have bags that are naked like this, they're geotextile fabric, or you can have them sealed in a poly uh, coating to hold the moisture a little bit better. Um, or you can have them in boxes. So those are all very common um, containerized growing systems. Uh, all of them have their advantages and disadvantages. I really like root systems in boxes, for instance. I hate handling them. I mean, those things are wicked hard and you can't pack many of them in a truck. The, the last kind then would be bald and burlap and for simplicity's sake to the left, those are machine harvested, slipped into a burlap lined basket to the right is just hand digging them the original way. We found harvest was significant. And the bottom line, if you look at very, very bottom, if we compared containers 
trees and containers planted. And this is where we included all six and a half thousand trees. Uh, containers versus bald and burlap, there's no difference. They all had the same survival rates. If you look at the other comparisons, bare root to bald and burlap, well, bare root had 2.86 times more likely to die than a bald and burlap. So basically anything that was bare rooted either in the spring or later in the year was more vulnerable and we had higher um, mortality rates. I will throw this at you. A typical bare root tree costs about anywhere from 10 to 20% of what a bald and burlap tree of the same size would cost. So you do have some size advantage. I will throw this at you there too. Uh, 10 years working for nurseries, I was in charge of harvesting for three different nurseries. I, I am one of the lucky nursery growers that doesn't walk with a stoop. Uh, if, you've, if you've handled many bald and burlap trees, you fall in love with bare rooted trees real fast, especially the older you get. So does, do, does location make a difference? This is the same study. And again, six and a half thousand trees. And we compared trees planted in boulevards versus street trees, um, <clears throat> excuse me, boulevards or street trees versus park or campus trees and then residential trees. So this is, this was pretty interesting. You know, when people talk about parks, especially parks versus boulevards, they envision this park looking like this. This is just beautiful. I mean, what tree wouldn't want to grow there? The reality of parks, especially most urban parks, is this, on a good day. Uh, you have some, maybe some remnant trees. This used to be a little forested area. Um, there's ground cover. Some of it may even be grass, probably mostly weeds in there. Uh, the soil is wicked hard, compacted. So that's really the reality of most, most parks. This is what we found. It was so interesting. The, ch the chances of a tree dying in a park versus a boulevard was 1.4 times. It's more dangerous for a tree growing in a park than it is in a boulevard. Some of these boulevards are like three feet wide, four feet, six feet, eight, 10 feet. You know, de-icing salt spraying on them. And yet it's better for a tree to be planted in boulevard than the park. And this is one that we had to go back to all these communities to try to figure out why. This is the reason why. To keep trees alive, that you know, they have to have water. That's the magic bullet. Try getting water evenly to 500 trees planted in a park or 50 trees into a park. It's very, very difficult. So you see pictures like this, it's like, oh, just drag out a hose and water. The, the, well, the hose is like 800 feet long. Um, or bucketing, that's my favorite one. Can you imagine how many buckets of water you'd have to drag around a typical park? Uh, that, was, that was the reason why, is they weren't receiving the same irrigation as trees in the boulevard. So trees and boulevard for a community, it's easier to water them with a water truck for one thing. Um, but there was another thing too. This is research that was done by Nina Basic and Ed Gilman many years ago. And it still is a pretty good uh, guide for keeping trees alive, you know, water-wise in those first few years is what's most important, it's frequency. I think we're all used to, I know the first landscape company I worked for, we installed a landscape and we'd set up sprinklers and you'd let the sprinklers run for 24 hours and figured that was enough to water everything. What a waste of water, first of all. Um, no, the frequency is most important. So a couple times a week, if you can do it during that first growing season, that's ideal. Sometimes three times a week too. Um, the dose is still important, but it's not as important as the frequency. So if you look at trees, and we're going to be talking about trees today, for each caliper inch of a tree, of a tree you need about a, a buck and a half, a gallon and a half water, a couple, couple gallons is fine. And that's the research done. And that was really good research too, by Nina and Ed. And the third thing, don't pay any attention to the weather reports. Um, I don't know how it is in New Mexico, but I've yet to find a place where uh, you know, it, they had a contest in Minnesota a few years ago. Who was the most accurate meteorologist? And Dave Dahl <clears throat> from Channel 5 was. He was right 51% of the time. Which means you could flip a coin each day and you'd be just as good as, as Dave Dahl. But there's another reason for why the boulevard trees seem to be doing better too. Uh, a lot of the communities promoted, if a tree is planted in front of your house, is there any way you would adopt it? You know, for that first growing season, take, you know, two times a week, take a five gallon bucket of water out 
and dunk it on. And it was very, very successful. My son is part of this uh, group here, brewing a better, my son really likes beer. Uh, he's part of uh, brewing a better forest. And what they did, they took it one step further. They said, if you sign up, we'll put you on this little interactive map. If you sign up to say that you're gonna water this tree for the first, uh, first growing season, we'll give you beer. Hugely successful. Keep in mind, Minnesota is right alongside of Wisconsin. Hugely successful, right? <laughs> if you offer beer, you make a lot of friends. And that was it. That's why the boulevard trees, despite the fact that they were in lousy sites, did better is they had more uh, community watering action than the parks did. This is really difficult. How about nursery stock? Well, you know, if you look at the research, there's unfortunately, there's been no research that says, oh, this type of nursery stock is, is better. I mean, consistently right across the board. We found evidence, you know, in our study, but that's one study, and I never found any other study. So put that in mind. Yeah, well, there is some, but, you know, intuitively, you're sitting there thinking, wait, wait a minute. Yeah, there is a difference. This is typically what happens if you use the smooth uh, sided plastic containers, containerized trees. You leave them in there too long. You don't correct that encircling root system when they're planted. And you come back three, four. These two trees have been in ground five years. This is in Rochester, Minnesota. And they, they started declining about third year by year five. They're completely dead. That's why they're in the autopsy area here. And you can see what happened is the root system never broke out of that encircling habit, never mined through the rest of the landscape soil for moisture and died an early death. So th this type of, we did quite a bit of research and we published on this a few years ago, is one of the things that we found is when you're looking at a, a containerized root system, you're going to see lots of encircling roots in there. If they're the real fine ones, ones you can flick off with your fingernail or something, no big deal. No big deal. If they have the diameter of about a pencil, thickness of a pencil, seven millimeters, big deal. Because they're woody and they've developed a memory and they're gonna stay growing in that pattern. And that's what happens with trees like this. You see the, you know, you may have gotten in the habit of thinking, well, I know lots of plants that I saw that were pot bound and they did it just, made it just fine. Yeah, but were the roots woody like this? So that's, that's what we found to be the, the litmus test on that. Real, real fine ones, don't worry about it. Woody ones. And then the second thing we did, and I'm kind of embarrassed to say this because for probably 30 years, um, I taught people that when you had containerized root systems, you did the four slices with a knife, crisscross, I don't know why you crisscross bottom, probably because I was taught that. Absolutely no research evidence for that. None. So we tested it out. Well, it turned out slicing them, you might as well throw milk on the soil ball. And it will have the same effect, nothing. Uh, Crisscrossing in the bottom, waste of time. Um, butterflying, that was a real popular one in books. Whoever invented or wrote up about the butterflying method where you slice the bottom and you pull it apart and plant it, never really did it. Um, because you would have to have shoulders like an oxen to, to pull those things apart, and get them in the ground. The one thing that did work was a, a technique that we're gonna look at a little bit. Um, it's called uh, boxing. Ed Gilman also uses it. He calls it slicing and it actually works. And we'll look at that in a few minutes. The next thing, this one, now don't, don't shoot the messenger on this one. So we looked at who planted these trees. We had a lot of communities and different agencies involved in this study. And we looked at, were the trees planted by a contracted company, landscape company or nursery? Were they planted by the municipality? So the municipalities, uh, landscape workers, tree workers, or were they planted by Jolly Bollies, volunteers, Arbor Day type things? And this is what we found. Uh, looking at those three categories, huh, there was no difference. No difference. Oh, I forgot to tell you one thing. On the volunteers, all these communities, all these agencies before volunteers planted trees, they had a short demo. They gave them training on how to plant the trees. And then they had supervisor, one supervisor for about every seven to 10 people. So in the end, there was no statistical difference in survival rates. Isn't that interesting? But when you think about it, really what was happening on this one, 
people were trained and they were supervised. So if you work for a nursery or landscape company, you're trained, you're supervised. Work for a municipality, you're trained, you're supervised. If you have volunteers and if they're trained and they're supervised, you should have about the same, you know, no, no big difference, no significant difference in survival rates. All right, so at the end of that study, what did we find that mattered? Well, the site type, that was boulevard versus park. Yeah, that mattered statistically. The species, yep, that one did matter too. And then the nursery stock site, containerized bull and burlap, highest survival rates, bare root and gravel grab bare root uh, had the lowest survival rates. So we looked at other studies, you know, did we miss anything? You know, everybody always says when you run a study, it's like, well, why didn't you? Why didn't you look at this? Why didn't you look at that? It's like, well, money, number one, uh, the amount of time. Um, we'll go back to my original statement. I'm really old. I, you know, I'm trying to get this stuff done before I croak as fast as I can. By the way, yeah, so I am Professor Emeritus. However, my, my predecessor, one week um, before this semester started, quit. So I'm contracted back at the university to teach. So I'm, I don't really know what to call me anymore semi-emeritus or formerly known as emeritus. I kind of like that one. Um, these are from other studies. If you look at the replicates, uh, not huge replicates on it, but they're still good studies. Uh, property ownership, that had a positive impact. So if the people owned the property that the trees were planted in front or in, in their green easement, yes, they had a higher survival rate. Root pruning of production nurseries, uh, tree stewardship by mun municipality. That means that this agency, after the trees were planted, made it their job to go out and periodically inspect and make sure that the trees were doing well and straightened up and watered as they needed to be. Um, neighborhoods with higher education rates. I'm just throwing that up there. Don't shoot the messenger. Planting depths, oh my gosh. How many more studies do we have to run to show that planting too deep kills trees? And if, you, if you're kind of a naysayer about current research, let's go back to the first study, the first published study, 1664. Here we go, folks. Uh, seasonal droughts, lots of studies, not much we can do about it. And then proximity to fraternity houses. This is a sidebar. So I get asked um, to, to do a lot of, uh, conduct a lot of research and people come in and they already know what the answer is gonna be. So we had this, this is University of Minnesota and these are the fraternity houses and for places. And it was, it, it, University of Minnesota is kind of embedded into residential neighborhoods. So the Marcy Holmes neighborhood uh, group came to me and said, we are really mad because these newly planted trees are getting busted and pulled out of the ground and, and branches broken off because of those drunken frat rats when they go to and from the football games. Said, well, what kind of evidence do you have for that? Well, we've seen it. You see, well, how, well, so they, they paid me. And uh, so we ran a study on it. And here's what we found. First of all, uh, the damage, the vandalism, the mortality rate um, in that neighborhood with the fraternities, et cetera, was the same as the rest of the community. Like, all right. But let's look a little bit closer. Uh, let's try to compare. Was, there, was, there, was, it, was that just the average or was it specific to certain areas of the community? Turned out to be specific to certain areas. Any areas of the community where they had planted trees and boulevards narrower than four feet wide were getting vandalized. Think about it. You're walking down the sidewalk, there's a newly planted tree and it just slaps you in the face. What are you going to do? You're going to say, oh, bless you, tree. I know someday you're going to be big and not slap me. No, they break the branches off or they get mad and they break the whole tree or they yank it out of the ground. So it wasn't the fraternity boys doing this. It was the fact that these trees were planted in skinny boulevards within two feet of the sidewalk. That was the highest vandalism rate. That was kind of a fun little study and I got paid to do it. Now we're looking at the establishment years. They've made it roughly past year five. And we're gonna look at these particular uh, factors. And again, there, there can be a lot more. One of my favorites one on this one is tree inconveniences. And we'll talk about that in a minute here too. So planting practices that catch up. Well, first of all, not correcting those encircling root systems. Um, and then the second one is you don't plant trees, you bury them. You don't bury trees, just plant them. 
So those are the two things that we're going to look at that have a lot of research behind it. First of all, uh, uncorrected uh, encircling root systems. If you look at the, um, the impact of the root ball to the left, nothing wrong with that. Those are fine roots. You can flick them off with your fingernail. You look to the right, though, and if that soil ball had had those pencil thickness roots encircling, they stay that way, unless you do a practice I'm going to show you. Um, this is one way of correcting encircling root systems, and we call it boxing. And we and Ed Gilman at Florida, just ironically, were doing the same research at the same time. The only difference is we, we do this above ground before the trees are planted. And if you've ever been into like a Greek restaurant or you have a gyro sandwich, that's basically how we treat these soil balls. They're just a chunk of gyro meat, and we slice off one inch all the way around. If they have woody encircling roots, at least the thickness of a pencil going around. If they don't, we don't do anything to them. And we had the same success. So then we take them out in the field and we plant them. Since we did this study, uh, we've had a lot of pushbacks. Like, well, when did you do this study? Well, we did it in the autumn. Well, if you had done it in the spring, okay, we set it up again. We did it in the spring, same result. Well, yeah, you did it in the autumn and spring, but how about if you did it in the summer? <laughs> set it up and we did it in the summer. So to date, we've had over 2000 trees in these studies. And, and then somebody also said, well, how about the, oh wait, not the winter, this is Minnesota. Okay. We'll buy this. Our, after over 2,000 trees, after those three studies, our mortality rate has been zero. We have yet to lose a tree. And a wide variety of species, too. Um, this is what happens. I did this just for demonstration. Same tree that you're looking here. Uh, I boxed it, and then I healed it in and wood, wood chip mulch. This is eight weeks later. And what I want you to notice, this is a birch, and we all know birches grow roots like crazy. But I want you to look at where they're growing. They're growing out. They're not encircling. So once you slice them off, they lose that, that habit. So it works. Okay. Um, I, I don't, I, you know, I, I like to avoid confrontation. So the same thing with uh, encircling roots. Why would I want to waste my time having to correct it if I can buy them without that problem? So one of the ways you can buy it without that problem is the air root pruning containers. That tree to the left is a crab apple. Pulled it out. This is a this is a production nursery. I pulled it out, washed all the soil off. That's a pretty typical root system. Do you see any encircling roots? No. no. Uh, to the right, we're growing them in bags. This is part of our, one of our research farms, and we use both the uh, plastic protected as well as the naked ones. Um, we will occasionally see some encircling roots are almost always very fine roots. And when you tear these bags off, if you've used them before, you can hear those roots ripping, root tips ripping. So you're doing a little bit of root pruning at that time. And again, I think the bags eliminate the problem. Will you ever see encircling roots on an air root pruning container or bag? Absolutely. Is it a problem? No. no. And we've worked with this for well over 10 years in our research studies. Um, Burring plants rather than planting them. This is one of our original studies. If you've heard of Bailey Nurseries, they're in St. Paul, but they're the second largest wholesale nursery in North America. And they let us set up this study right in their nursery. So it's right in their production areas. Uh, the index finger is pointing at the first uh, order root. That's where it should have been planted at the surface or near the surface. This particular one was buried for six, uh, six inches. This is six weeks later. This is an ash tree. And look at all those roots, and they're starting to encircle. Those are all adventitious roots. Some of them are growing out, like this one growing away, this one growing away. But some of them are curving back. Now, you may think they're curving back because they hit the edge of the container. This is the edge of the container over in here. They're curving back because there's a sweet spot. And that sweet spot is that area between the trunk stem and the soil. Good oxygen, good moisture, roots are growing there. So this is how fast it can happen. Same thing if you use um, lindens, little leaf lindens, they're just as bad too. Don't do that. If you do that, this is what happens. This is 10 years later. And I mean, there's a real good reason why I'm conducting these autopsies is these trees were dying. It was on the golf course. They thought they had planted them correctly. They were buried too deeply in the big bald and burlap soil balls. They didn't correct them at planting. 10 years later, they're starting to defoliate in early August. Growth is stunted. We start doing these root collar exams 
And this is what we're finding on every single tree. So they can be, uh, end up being girdled by uh, adventitious roots, or in this case, these are roots coming up from the original root system to the surface where there's better water and oxygen, and then finding that sweet spot around the trunk of the tree and just proliferating. So, you know, what's the big deal? Maybe it's just an anomaly. No, it isn't. One of the things that you'll find, there's a higher frequency of stem, stem cracking, frost cracking, and you know with frost cracking, you have to have three conditions. You have to have a previous wound, could be a pruning wound, could be a lawnmower. Um, you need to have cold temperatures, winter, and you need to have a drought stress situation. How could they be drought stressed in the golf course? When you look at a stem girdle on the roof, each year it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it makes it harder and harder and harder for water to move up the tree. So you can have an irrigated landscape and it's drought stressed. And that's what happened with these. The second thing that happens, there's a higher frequency of the initiation of decay. If you notice the arrow wiggling, that's a function of all the coffee I've had today. So a higher frequency of decay. So you have frost cracking, you have more decay. And then the third thing is, and we'll talk about this more this afternoon, a higher frequency of failure in wind loading events too. This is not a wind throw. This thing broke off below ground. This is below ground. There's the soil line. We can't even see the first main order root. That's a compression area right in there from the uh, stem girdling root on this particular tree. And that's where it snapped off. And on a lot of trees, when you have that, you also have decay going in there too. So how do you take care of it? By the way, look at that tree in the left. Uh, that's one that uh, Davy Tree sent me a few years ago. That tree is a... Uh, Crimson King Maple, it's been 15 years. I have this philosophy that <clears throat> everything deserves to die with some dignity. That thing deserved to die a long time ago. It's like, this is what you have after 15 years. That's embarrassing for a tree. Yeah, you just take a saw and you saw off that X. There's a couple of things you can do. If you look at the soil ball here, you can see lots of roots and you see nothing up here. I call that the dead zone. So a real quick examination, you can see a dead zone. And you can say, all right, I know there's at least that much that's excess soil in there. So you can saw it off with a saw. Like, by the way, when you use a saw, be wicked careful. Don't just you know, power your way through because you'll cut off the trunk and that's not good. So be very careful about it and just go all the way around, make one, you take it off, like, it's like a piece of pizza almost when you take it off. How long does this take? about two minutes. <clears throat> How long does it take to come back 15 years later, cut down the tree, dig out the root system, plant a new tree, wait for 15 years for it to get to the size it should be? Two minutes at planting time, that, that is sweet. So published research on burring uh, root system, again, we'll go back to 1664, John Evelyn. Uh, Lions and Yoder, 1980, I'm just kind of stepping up, showing you there's lots of research on it. Lions and Yoder on fruit trees in the 80s. <clears throat> Rich Hauer and I in year 2000, Rich Hauer and I just published again last year. Um, basically, just experiment after experiment after experiment. Don't do it. Don't bury trees, plant trees. And how, how deep should they be? Within an inch of the soil surface. Uh, a little bit of proof of that. Go for a walk in the woods whenever you can sometime and shuffle your feet. Guarantee you're going to face plant because those surface roots are right up there under the duff layer, under, in your case, the landscape, the mulch layer, and that's where they should be, not buried. Construction activities start catching up with these trees in the establishment years. Um, this is, when you look at, the, this is one of my favorite photos here, is you look at the left, <clears throat> look out in the street. They have the dumpster, they have permission from the city to store everything in the street while construction on the house is going on. Somehow they thought trees like soil, more, more soil, more better. Why put the soil out in the street? Let's pile it up over the root system from April to November. So from April to November, that root system is getting no oxygen and no moisture. In the center, my absolute favorite construction picture. This is what happens when you let engineers make forestry decisions. Look closely at this tree. There's the tree and see the scaffolding. They built it around the canopy of the tree. They thought they did a really good job. 
They really needed a forester to consult. And then to the right, this is one of the success, success stories. There is the original curb line. And this particular community, the residents of the communities just railed at the idea that the city was gonna widen the streets. We don't need wider streets. We can actually live in more narrow streets. So the new curbing is out here now. They gained almost two feet of a boulevard width for the trees. So there's a lot of things that people say, oh, we just can't do it, it's impossible. No, they are possible. All right, this afternoon again, I'm gonna get way into depth on this, but sidewalk replacement is a huge issue. Uh, one of the issues is, I mean, just we have to, uh, communities have to minimize the danger of people tripping. Now the sidewalk to the left, that's a Norway maple, roots being lifted. You know, the kids in this neighborhood, especially the kids on the skateboards, love it. It's like, why on earth would you ever replace something like this? Um, but it has to be replaced because not everybody's on a skateboard. Uh, and so to, to replace that sidewalk, what do they have to do? They have to cut the offending roots and then pour the new sidewalk in there. Or again, if you leave forestry decisions up to engineers, and again, you know, the thing is, they did this, this is the law of unintended consequences. They did this thinking, we're doing a really good thing for the tree. Um, <clears throat> I'm moving this out. So look at all the extra room that the roots for that tree, can, of course, everything's cut below that. But it was, it was done in good faith. So what to expect in this establishment year when there are a lot of construction activities? Well, um, you can expect offensive dieback. That's just the tree being smart. You know, I've lost all these roots. I can't support the entire crown. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to sacrifice them because the, the very tips of the branches, that's the last place water gets to. So they don't have enough root system, not enough water. So that's no big deal. What do you do? You schedule deadwood pruning. And you can start about two years after that. So after construction, figure I'm gonna go back to these trees in the boulevard, deadwood prune them, and they're gonna be okay. Second thing is they become more vulnerable. Uh, they become more vulnerable to um, stress diseases and disorders, but in particular, oh, some things like the like nectaria canker or the scale insects. Scale, most scale insects really hone in on uh, trees that are drought stressed or water stressed in this case, because lots of roots. Uh, reduced growth. You know, if you're a municipal arborist, you're probably pumping your fist saying, thank goodness. Or if you're a utility arborist, um, yeah, reduced growth, this is great. I don't have to come back every five years to prune these trees for a while. Uh, what can you do to, to uh, address that? If it's a residential area or park, just protect that critical root area. You know, there are a lot of formulas for it. An easy one to remember is, <clears throat> for each inch of diameter, go out one foot and radius two foot, three foot. So a 10 inch diameter would have a radius of 10 feet, diameter 12 feet. If you can protect those roots, keep them mulched, keep them watered, you're really gonna minimize the damage. And then for, for the last one, the decay potential. You know, if the decay really moves in on these trees that, you know, are between that five and 30 year old, <clears throat> man, don't, don't feel like you have to save everything. If they're becoming fraught with decay at that point, have time work for you instead of against you. Consider removing them and replanting. And a lot of times that is the best thing you can do. Or you can work with the contractors. And this is a really good example of working with the contractors. Instead of using <clears throat> these huge, normally what you're gonna see is this excavated area over in here can be as great as two feet so they can get in there, put the forms. But if they use slip forms, that's the extent of the excavation. And then if they hand pour it, it's even smaller. This is technology, these are, these are techniques that have been around for years and years and years, request it. It's a really good way, especially if those trees are critical. If they can't, look at the size of that tree, get rid of it, plant a new one. Okay, another little bit of controversy, 15 minutes, okay. Landscape management practices. And I think most of these you're gonna say, oh yeah, I see this all the time. Uh, lawns, lawnmowers, string trimmers, then we'll look at non-target chemical drift, and then weed-free turf versus healthy trees. Uh, this I call spousal abuse. <clears throat> Every time I've gone to, especially when I was with the university, people call it, say, can you come out? I want you to look at this tree to see if it's okay. And it's like, oh, it's close to campus. I'll go look at it. And I go out and it's like, wow, this thing really got hit bad by 
you know, a lawnmower. And, and it's always like, oh yeah, my spouse does, did that. That's really interesting because I talked to your spouse a few minutes ago and that person said their spouse, one of you is lying or both of you are lying, et cetera. Oh, well, we only did it once. No, you did, you did it more than once. This is, now you have decay starting in here. So this is fairly common, whether it's a lawnmower or whether it's a string trimmer. Um, Non-target chemical drift. Uh, um, Bruce, are you here today? Thank you, Bruce, for this photo. Um, dicamba is a very common lawn chemical, uh, broadleaf weed control. This is what it can do when it goes to plants that you don't want it to kill. Didn't necessarily kill the plant. You try selling those trees if you're a grower. You know, if you tell people, oh, don't worry about it. If next year, they're gonna be just beautiful. I'm gonna come back next year, just in case. Then I'll see if they're beautiful, then I may buy them. Um, this is fairly common. This is another one of my favorites too. Um, why, you know, why did you spray glyphosate, you know, when it was so windy? Oh, we never sprayed glyphosate. Yes, you did. Well, it's either that or paraquat, one of the two. No, we never used those two. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. This is in a park. And if you look closely at this tree, and then this one, and then this one, and then this one, it was sprayed when it was too windy. Okay. They kept denying it. And I, I said, you've never used Roundup? Oh, well, yeah, we use Roundup. Okay. Why were you spraying the trees with Roundup? Well, they had poison ivy growing on them. And we didn't want to have to handle it. So they were trying to kill the poison ivy. Law of unintended consequences. So the lawn chemicals versus healthy trees, broadleaf herbicides, non-selective herbicides, pre-emergent herbicides. Preen is one of the, I have a real problem with preen. Fungicides and insecticides. These are the ones that they do um, damage to, to the landscape. Because what they do is our landscape trees, our trees are dependent upon mycorrhizal root associations. Those are fungal root associations. All right, if they use fungicides on a golf course, you can see how they kind of decline. Makes sense to kill fungi. Insecticides, herbicides, they have salts in them. They kill the fungi too. So you start getting a different group of fungi and it declines and the trees start this long-term decline. Sometimes they die, sometimes they just look puny. Um, preen has been a real problem. How many of you have used preen? It's used a lot in perennial gardens. It's treflam. It's used a lot in perennial gardens. If you follow the manufacturer's directions, there's no problem with them. <clears throat> if you get in situations where you know, I'm supposed to put down, it's like maybe two times a year. I'm going to put down every month. You know, I have a really weed tree. And it says to use one pound per 100 square feet. <clears throat> I'm going to use two pounds per 100. Here's what happens. And it takes a lot of digging to find this out. Preen or treflan inhibits fine root production on woody plants. So year after year, those woody trees that may be part of this perennial garden, each year, their fine root system is getting lower and lower and lower and lower. They're getting drought stress. And yet the whole place is irrigated. So preen is one of those that we've had some real issues with. Um, then we have diseases and insect pests to start moving in. You know, some of our primary diseases, they just come in. You didn't do anything wrong. They just came in, Dutch elm disease, a little dash borer, 1,000 cankers, walnut. And then we have the contributors. These are the ones that are stinkers. The wood boring or insects or the bark insects, target cankers and scale. So Dutch elm disease, you see it, it's pretty easy to recognize, pretty easy to diagnose. Again, emerald ash borer, one of the easiest ones to diagnose. Unfortunately, we're getting lots of specimens of this too. And then 1,000 cankers of walnut. I just put this up just to make sure that you know 1,000 cankers of walnut is in New Mexico. It's hammering walnuts in Colorado. But it, it is here, and it's, again, it's another one of those things that it's getting, it's attacking the trees and killing them because they're walnuts. They are very selective about that. So what can be done, Dutch elm disease, emerald ash borer, you can use a preventative um, injections of, of uh, fungicides or insecticides, and you can keep the trees alive for a long time. Thousand cankers of walnut, that's a little bit different. Um, the, the only thing that may help is just keeping them from being too, too stressed. Uh, keep them well watered and mulched, and that's about it. Target cankers, now these are fungal cankers that hit stressed trees, and they really hit like ash and maple in particular. So why doesn't every ash and maple have a target canker? 
from it. They have to be stressed and they have to be wounded. So stress is primarily drought, water stress, wounding, string trimmers, pruners, lawn mowers, any opening and that fungus can get in there. Scale insects, we see scale insects all the time. When do they actually kill a tree? Um, when something like elm scale or, or some of the oak scales too, when those trees are already vulnerable, they're already drought stressed or they've had a bunch of roots cut from construction, that's when scale insects can just go turkey berserky on them and just finish them off. And people look at it and say, oh, the scale insects kill the trees. No, what killed the trees or shortened their lives was they lost their roots during construction or it got very, very droughty. So what can you do about that? All these contributors, the scale insects, the target cankers, you know, mulch the root zone just as much as your client will stand it. Um, that's gonna help a lot. That's gonna reduce uh, evaporation of soil water by about 30%. It's good research-based information. Uh, watering during dry periods if you can, and, and minimize wounding, especially the lawnmower string trimmers, and then critter damage too. Um, buck raking, rabbit feeding, et cetera. Tree inconveniences, I call this a political collateral damage. And for instance, I've used sweet gum. We could also use ginkgos. If you've planted these before and when the fruit starts falling, you start getting calls and you go, hey, you know, it's a really good tree for the area. And then they go, okay, you're not satisfying me. I'm gonna call the mayor or I'm gonna call a city council. And all of a sudden you have to remove every single sweet gum every single ginkgo. Um, even though they're really good trees for the site, it doesn't make any difference. Cottonwoods, oh my gosh, people just have heart attacks. When the female cottonwood sheds all the, by the way, have you ever seen a cottonwood seed? They're like, oh, maybe an eighth of an inch. They're teeny. And you look at the size of the trees. It's just a magical type of thing. Yeah, there's, you know, get a leaf blower or vacuum out there or something. Don't cut down the trees. So what can you do? Just don't answer the phone. That's, that's about all I can I tell you to do. Um, delayed pruning and wind loading events. These are for the trees that are notoriously poorly built. And I hate to say this because we've done so much research on American elm varieties that are Dutch elm disease resistant. They're the worst of the bunch. So our native elms, um, if you don't prune them, Every single year for the first 15 years, you're gonna have train wrecks. And you're gonna have train wrecks starting right about the time they're, oh, maybe seven inch DBH. And you have wind loading events or ice loading events or snow loading events, and they start falling apart. The other group that is especially vulnerable are the Freeman maples, uh, the Autumn Blaze, the Sienna Glens, et cetera. Uh, they too are very poorly built. So you need to get in there and prune, prune, prune those first 15 years. Uh, hackberries, coffee trees, uh, they're bad, not nearly as bad though. So for those, I recommend pruning every two to three years for the first 15 years. Both of those trees have a bad habit. When, they, when they're germinated, when they're grown from seed, as soon as they come out of the ground, they wanna go decurrent. And, and they'll do that for 15 years. Just be, and, and so you have to prune off those weaknesses. Weather aberrations, there's not a whole lot we can do about this. Uh, you know, if the polar vortex sweeps down here, or uh, wind loading events or ice flooding, and so, that stuff's just gonna happen. The only thing you can do is try to select plants that are gonna do well in the site and, and maybe have a better chance of, of, of remaining there. So this is in Minnesota. This is our native red oak. Um, this is one of the worst imaginable urban sites. Um, in Minnesota, we have a lot of ice and snow, and so we use a lot of de-icing salt, and the cheapest is sodium chloride. So in areas like this, downtown Minneapolis to the right is a very expensive hotel, and the pavement around there, they don't just sprinkle the icing, they mulch with the icing salt, because they want to make sure nobody slips, trips, and hurts themselves. And as a result, over the years, uh, the trees just keep getting weaker and weaker and weaker. So try to keep the trees as healthy as possible, uh, minimize pushing cold hardening in the zones. I don't know if that's a problem here, but in the upper Midwest, people, I think that one thing in the upper Midwest that we could do that would really help is ban the magazine Southern Living. Do not allow that in any of the grocery stores or anything, or home improvement, because people see it and they go, oh, I want that, I want that dog bird. It's like, no, it's, it's not gonna make it here too. Um, and now we're to the very last quick part. How many more minutes? 
five. Oh, this is working out perfectly. Uh, the assisted living years. And now the trees have gotten up. They're past that establishment phase. So they're, you know, years 35 plus. Um, what can we do to, to keep them there for a long time? Um, in its native regions, a burr oak has about a 250 to 450 year lifespan. That's normal. Silver maple, about 125 years. Um, do you grow box elders in New Mexico? How long does a box elder live? No one knows. They live forever. They just keep sprouting and sprouting, et cetera. Um, so when you get down to the, the weakest of them, there are some of the birches. So they have a lifespan of about 65 years. When I hear people saying, oh, we got 30 years out of this tree, that's really, good. that's embarrassing. Um, <clears throat> this is my truck, this is a bumper sticker. I'd like to have a nickel for every time somebody has come up and they look at it, they go, oh, I really like that bump. You know, I never thought about that. It's like, seriously, you never thought that it takes 100 years to get a 100 year old tree. Hmm. So what are the challenges to maturity? Uh, hair loss is a big one, I didn't put this up here. Uh, continued threats from construction activities, deadwood and risk management loading events, and then this general decline in energy reserves. This poor cottonwood every morning wakes up and goes, I know this is the day they're gonna get rid of me. I've damaged this curve way too much. Uh, this is like, oh, it's a silver maple. Silver maples can take anything. No, they can't. They can't take 12 feet of soil piled over the root system for months. Um, deadwood and risk management, this, this is something you have to watch all the time. Hackberries are kind of vulnerable to Ganoderma. Uh, decay, especially if their buttress roots have been cut during construction. And if we start having this defensive dieback, you have to put this on schedule to make sure you go through and remove those, those risk factors. And then loading events. Uh, the poor, poorly built trees are more susceptible to the loading events, except for tornadoes. The only thing it makes it in tornadoes are little trees. But the other normal loading events and then decline in energy reserves. Uh, the tree to the left, the arborist told the clients, don't worry, this thing is gonna bush out like a petunia plant. Um, there are no energy reserves hardly left in that tree. The tree in the center, a baroque in decline, hardly any re energy reserves. Tree to the right is a little leaf linden declining in, in, a, in a boulevard situation. Uh, when they decline, they get infested by the um, linden borer. Linden borer wounds it and then we start getting um, white rot in the trunk and then they're gone. You can't keep them in the landscape anymore. So what to do, schedule again, pruning, cable is appropriate, cabling really works, avoiding drought stress right down to risk assessments. Um, I have put in a lot of cables in my lifetime and I really like the, the dynamic ones, but I put a lot of static ones in too. I've yet to see a tree, whether I did or other people did it, that was cabled correctly, that failed in a windstorm. I've seen these, these trees go down from other parts of the tree fail in windstorm, and you still see the cables intact, and that union is still protected. So how'd I do? Right on time, great, thank you. <clears throat> I appreciate all the caffeine you had before you came in, and I didn't hear any foreheads slamming on the tables, which is really good news. Do we have any questions from the audience? You can either come up and use the speakers or raise your hand. And if you're loud enough, we can hear you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yep. It's Brian, right? Yeah. Brian. So Brian pointed out two things, uh, a higher frequency of damage to trees because homeowners are selecting Roundup 365, which if you have not had good success killing your trees with Roundup, go to Roundup 365. Uh, that's the first thing. And there's not a whole lot you can do when you have products that you can buy in home improvement stores or Walgreens or something like that. Yeah. 
I know who reads, nobody reads labels. You know, that's, if you, ha if you have a kid in fourth grade, you have the, your kid read the labels, you don't read the labels. It's like putting together a new computer. Nobody reads. Second problem is when scale insects uh, get really bad on a tree, it's not the scale insects that cause the trees to be removed. It's the sap or the exudates that are falling on the picnic tables. So again, we have another uh, socially unacceptable situation and you've got to remove those trees. Now the whole lot you could do it. Yes, sir, in the back. Oh, I'm going to come back. Remember, I'm old. Mm -hmm. It comes up a lot when you talk about preservation um, can really be a, a difficult thing to advise on. Yep. Um, do you have anything you could say on that? Yeah, the question, the question was, uh, when you get in these extreme droughty situations of prolonged chronic droughts and you have mature trees, what can you do to convince people to water those mature trees? Um, part, of it, part of it is just a history of how people think about trees. They think, oh, this tree is an old growth tree. First of all, there's hardly any old growth trees left anymore, especially in urban areas. And it's been through everything. No, it hasn't been through everything. And you really need to understand, it's a living being. And just like you, it needs water. Then the second thing is like, well, do you know how much that's going to cost me? And they go, actually, I do. And so we, we did a study a few years ago where we looked at newly planted, established, and mature trees. And we looked at mature trees and how much would it cost to go out to the drip line of a mature tree one time a month and irrigate the soil uh, using a sandy loam soil uh, down to um, a depth of 10 inches. How many in here smoke cigarettes? And I'm not judging you. There we go, we have one here. The cost of a pack of cigarettes will pay for that watering for that summer, May, June, July, August. And we took the highest, the highest rates for water and sewage in Minnesota, and that's what we came up with. So when you, when you can relate it to, although, you know, if you wanna make friends with a new client, don't ask them if they smoke cigarettes, just say something like, you know how much a pack of cigarettes costs? You know, that for that amount of money, you can water your tree. And if you're on a well, you don't have to pay it, but you do have to decide whether or not your well can stand it. But what you need to do in the bottom line is once a month, soak it down to about 10 or 12 inches. And then if you can put a mulch layer on it, remember what I said, that, re that reduces evapo or evaporation loss about 30%. So that's all I can say. It's a tough one to get across because it involves the W word, you know, work. They have to get out there and water it. Anything else? That's a really good question, though. Very, very common one. I guess that's it. Oh, we have one more. How about like the amount of, the amount of uh, like knowledge for um, volume of soil and soil composition? OK, the question is, is there a variation of amount of water you need depending on the type of soil and the maturity of the tree? Absolutely, yes. The larger the tree, the more leafy biomass, the more water they're going to transpire. It's going to take more. When you look at soil, if you have a sandy soil, the very first thing I would do after irrigating is quickly mulch it. Because otherwise, it's just going to evaporate out of it. Your best soils for holding moisture are your clay soils, clays and silts. And then everything in between, um, as long as you don't have a drainage problem, if you can incorporate organic matter into the soil without damaging the roots, that's going to help. If you think you're going to damage roots by incorporating it, you know, dig it in or rototilling, use it as a surface mulch. You know how mulch breaks down. From the top surface, it looks the same for years. Underneath where it meets the soil, it's becoming soil. And it's really doing a good job of holding moisture. So that's kind of the range. Um, I use the, I use the uh, sandy loam because that's like our best soil for growing trees in production. Thank you very much. I can feel the hook. Ha, ha, ha.